Ev did not show up. Uh, but uh, Sumo Main Fall is the lead author. Anthony Watts, John Nielsen, Gammon did a tremendous amount of work on uh, this paper. Analysis of the impact of station exposure on the HCN. Uh, this was uh, really Anthony Watts spearheaded uh, a, a project to have volunteer people go out and take pictures and, and look at the uh, various HCN uh, sites to see at current time uh, what the situation was about them. The sites were rated and then re-rated and verified uh, a number of ways. So they were, and actually more than two people did this, so there was an uh, independent uh, check on each one of these. And we're using the CRN uh, categories one through five for one is the best, five is the worst. And so here are th examples of the Five different uh, rating systems on the far left is uh, Roger Pelkey Sr.'s favorite HCN station at Cheyenne Wells. It's, I don't know if that farm implement has been there next to that screen for <laughs> 100 years, but it's, uh, it's a pretty good station. And then you can see as you go two, three, four, how the encroachment of uh, uh, development, human development has uh, ended up there that when you get to Anthony Watts' favorite station at Tucson, uh, it's the uh, screen that's right out in the parking lot, and as we all know, that's, a, that's an outlier. Uh, there was an interesting quote about this station in uh, Mohonk Lake, uh, New York, that uh, it has been exactly the same spot for 100 years or so since Grover Cleveland was president, and I don't know if that tree and the stump was right there the whole time, but uh, that looks like it might not be a completely good station. Uh, so the country was divided, the lower 48 was divided into uh, uh, nine sections in each one. Uh, we're going to look mainly at the climate, uh, at the reference stations one and two together, which uh, gave about 8% of the total of stations. Uh, CRM5, the worst, also had about 8% of the total stations. And we see the distribution there of the one twos and the fives. The three and four, there were hundreds of them, so they would fill up the map as you've seen. Uh, earlier, and this will be uh, part of the um, analysis, or part of the analysis included the fact that, well, the uh, CRN ones and twos were in a little different spot than in the CRN fives in each region, and so was that a factor in making some of the differences occur? Uh, so, as uh, I mentioned there, the station anomalies were averaged with each climate region, and area weighted to come up with. Uh, trends, and these are ordinary least squares trends. And this is the point I alluded to. There was Monte Carlo testing. Uh, they were randomly, there was randomly assigned stations to the two groups, uh, one and two and five, and uh, the number of stations were preserved in each group, but the thing was you could take uh, stations in three and four and substitute them in for one and two, and stations in three and four, substitute them in for five just to see if the if the geographic difference in where the ones and twos were located versus the fives would make a difference, repeat that 10,000 times. This is where John uh, Nielsen Gammon was a real uh, help. Uh, so for the confidence testing, this is what I was referring to, find the nearest unique uh, three or four station, which is, you know, the ones that are kind of okay, and to the one, twos, and fives, compute the trends with these proxy, these threes and fours, instead of the one, twos, and fives, and see if there's any sensitivity to that. And so here are results. These are trends in uh, degrees C per year. And uh, uh, what you see here are a number. Uh, average temp is on the left. In the middle is maximum. On the right is minimum temperature. In the far right is the diurnal range, the trend in the diurnal range. So what you see here is poorer stations uh, imply lower maximum trends as you go through time in general. The uh, um, lightest bar is the one and two. The darkest bar is the five. The uh, uh, minimum temp shows the opposite, that the uh, poorer stations have the highest, and that kind of makes sense. You know, the urbanization is impacted by uh, that most. Way. And then the diurnal effect, oh, the mean temperature, therefore, is kind of a, wi a wash. You know, the max and mins wipe out each other. The diurnal effect, though, is where it really is interesting because you see it's very nice... Uh, progression from uh, a diurnal actual increase in the one and twos down to a, uh, a shrinkage of the diurnal effect, minimums hotter, maximums cooler as you go through time. So the adjustments eliminated class differences for the average temperature trend, but not the others. So the f 
in the three groups of each of these four, you see the adjusted um, transit that uh, our colleagues here have done and uh, that, that did eliminate the problem in the average trends, but not, you see, in things like the diurnal, which we, we might want to wonder if that's good or bad. Uh, so if you look at the time series, this is only three years, 30 years that we're looking at here. The temperature anomalies changed <coughs> during the MMTS uh, transition, which occurred in this time series. You might want to just look at, uh, you can see here in the minimum, see this red is down here below, and then it ends up higher up here as you see the warming of the minimum through that time. And then uh, that is then... Uh, uh, but however, the class differences are still there. In other words, that min is still rising, or, or the diurnal effect is still small for the worst sighted station. And that's what... The, and now this goes back all the way to 1895, and we see the same thing here. I, uh, the point, I think that I like to uh, see in this, in the adjusted uh, USHCN, notice here the diurnal effect of the best stations, the ones and twos, as they were in the past few years, have no diurnal trend at all. So you might think that that then would be a pretty good indication of a great station is that the max and min trends are identical for 116 years or whatever this is. However, we still see the... Uh, um, Trends for the worst stations, very different. Even though these are adjusted, that difference is still there, which is um, uh, what I think I saw this morning in the talk. That there's still some urban effect of the worst stations, worst sighted stations, which, from my point of view, might not might be a success in the sense you have, the sense you have preserved <coughs> what is happening in a uh, urban area as a real signal in the minimum temperature. As I mentioned this morning, it's very important for load forecasting and so on for utilities know, to know what the real temperature is. Um, this is sort of just the physics behind this. As you know, at nighttime, often the nocturnal boundary layer, uh, the warm air above, okay, uh, the warm air uh, occurs above, wake up here, and the, we actually measure the uh, temperature in this shallow uh, cold boundary layer. Whereas in the daytime, you get lots of mixing and so on, and whatever is happening in the deep atmosphere, you would have a better chance of, of uh, catching it with a, a temperature. And, and especially when you compare with a climate model, for example, uh, they have so few degrees of freedom in the vertical and have a lot of problems with vertical adjustments and lapse rates and so on that it would be better, uh, a more direct measurement to check with Tmax rather than Tmin because these kind of features really don't uh, show up well in uh, model projections at all. And then over time, what might happen is this, where in the pristine case of a CRN 1 or 2, we would still have the ability to form this very delicate nocturnal boundary layer. And I, I say that's delicate because just very small changes in the, in the forcing uh, in wind speed or whatever can create mixing, which then uh, causes that temperature to appear to rise when, in fact, all you're doing is is mixing down the warmer air. And this can happen from buildings, which create more roughness, um, aerosols, which create more uh, forcing uh, downward, and so on, that uh, can then nonlinearly create this uh, dynamical system that appears to show this warming. Um, so here we have, uh, in terms of the comparison of temperatures, I, I think kind of mentioned this, that the average temperature at poorer sites is relatively warm. So this is the average temperature increases uh, through CRN uh, siting. The average GTR gets lower, especially on the poorest sites, the ones that are city-fied and all. And so now to compare with uh, Matt's paper on what uh, they had done a year or two ago, 2009, 2009, um, where they used 40% of the USHCN stations that uh, really didn't have the uh, kind of ratings that had been done here, where these are the final ratings, uh, and many, many more stations, especially those in the more rural areas that were not part of this uh, 40%. And as you saw, that the mean bias of the temperature uh, really didn't change uh, from site status to site status. Um, we see that there's much of a difference. Oh, the reds, by the way, are, are sort of different conclusions than the uh, pale green or whatever that is. Uh, so as we run through here, uh, there was a negative bias in the maximum temperature found in both studies. Uh, 
there was little bias in the minimum found in the mats, but uh, we still see this artificial minimum temperature bias in these results. Um, adjustments largely account for the impact of instrument siding changes, and we see we still see a difference in that uh, 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 in that diurnal effect. You still see a siting characteristic as part of that um, difference between the best sites and the worst sites. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that uh, while we both see the maximum temperature difference and the adjustments about the same, the minimum uh, is uh, uh, still requires something more if you want the grand vision of the climate signal. Uh, and no effect on the average temperature transfer conus as uh, they have. Okay, so new, we did this uh, tremendous amount. We, uh, Nielsen Gammon and, and all the other crowd on the top part of that author list, a lot of statistical uh, significance testing and some pairwise tests. No long-term diurnal trend in the best stations there were. And um, uh, the diurnal trend, of course, is smallest for the poor stations. And the average temperature uh, is lower, actually, for the most poorly sited stations. OK, that I think I'm through. I don't know, unless Deb wants to say something. <laughs> Okay, we, we do have time for some questions, um, and uh, come on up to the microphone if you'd like to, to uh, make a comment or ask a question so it can be recorded. So you, you really highlighted the, the difference in the diurnal temperature range, so I wanted to point out that um, because the standard and homogeneity adjustments is to sort of preserve the current status of the station and, and model the, the past data as though we're, we're always under those observation practices. And 70% of the network converted to MMTS, which caused a decrease in the diurnal temperature range, which we preserve by design in homogenization. So you would never expect homogenization to remove that diurnal temperature range signal. And your poorer sites are dominated by MMTS, which you didn't bring up. And I, I think that's sort of the outstanding analysis that has to maybe be a follow-on to this analysis. Would you agree with that? Um, well, I, I would agree that there is still diurnal biases, <coughs> trends in the diurnal biases in the data sets. I think that's what you were saying. A and that you did not want to remove those because they are real. Well, we preserve the, we try to, um, the homogenization models, the current conditions as though they were always that way. So because MMTS has a smaller diurnal temperature range, that's what you get. I mean, that's, that's, that's the new instrument. Well, what we need, I think, is a time series of those categories for each station through time. Each of your CRN categories? Yeah, through time. Yeah, so if you, I mean, and so then you, your CRN one twos are not dominated by MMTS, and so you don't see that. That's that's the point I'm trying to make. So you you sort of proved what the MMTS impact is, yeah. I think, basically. Other questions, comments? Deb, do you want to add anything? Good, job. Okay. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> All right, thanks, John. <laughs>